good morning. I'm so excited to be here today. I want to thank Joel and um, the, the committee, the prayer breakfast committee, for inviting us here and for all of the prayer and all of the effort that they put into this morning, into this prayer breakfast. And um, our dinner that we had last night and the warm reception that we've had, we had a little tour of Sioux Falls. This is my second time to South Dakota, uh, my first time to Sioux Falls. So um, thank you so much for making us feel like family already. And, um, you know, I just, looking out in this crowd this morning, I want to thank all of you for showing up today. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful group of people. And um, I know that you come from all walks of life. And, um, you know, we have every kind of person represented here. Moms, dad, you know, old, young, business people, um, maybe some stay-at-home moms. And, um, you know, just so many different uh, people, the ones that have been prayed for today. And, um, we're just so excited that you all came this morning. And, um, you know, I, I don't believe um, that this is a coincidence that Eric and I are here today on this Good Friday. And, um, you know, as a younger child, I always wondered why we called it Good Friday when that was the day that um, Jesus was crucified. And as I've journeyed through life, I realize it's because of the significance of that sacrifice that was made um, so that we could all be forgiven of our sins. And um, so I, as we take you on a journey that began uh, between the two of us on May 11, 2002, um, I hope that you will keep in mind that forgiveness that um, we're here today to represent. Our story is a story of forgiveness. And I hope that you will keep in mind, you know, um, the reason that we're all here today is because of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who died to save us from our sins. And I'm going to start with a little background about myself, and um, then I'm going to let Eric come up and, and give you some background about himself. Um, but, it, you know, I just want to get you up to speed on May 11th of 2002, so you need a little background before that day um, when our lives collided. I was born and raised in Pensacola, Florida. Um, we actually are from Florida, so it's a little chilly here. And, um, <laughs> you know, I'm glad my dad called me and said, take some warm clothes. Um, but I was born there and lived in Florida my whole life. And I, I'm thankful that I was born into a home where Christ was the center of it. And I can tell you, I've always loved to tell people, you know, I just came into the world loving Jesus. And I can't remember a time when I didn't. And, I, you know, I, I accepted him as my, you know, I did a public profession of faith when I was about eight years old. And, um, you know, some of you here may not realize, you know, the significance of that, if you're an unbeliever, you know, a profession of faith, believing in someone that you can't even see and wanting to serve that person and commit your life to them. Um, but, you know, I knew as a young girl I had the faith of a child, I still do, and I always believed in Christ, and um, that was, you know, just the next step to, to start memorizing those scriptures and keeping his word in my heart so that I wouldn't sin against him. But I also want you to know that, you know, even though we accept Christ and we walk that life, most of you know this, you know, it doesn't mean our journey is going to be easy, and it doesn't mean that we're not going to face adversity, and it doesn't mean that we're not going to be tempted. And it's always very important for me to point out to people that, you know, I'm not a perfect person. I've never had a perfect life. Yes, I love Jesus, and yes, I've committed myself to him, but I've had, you know, a lot of the same struggles that all of you have had. And I've been tempted, and I've fallen into temptation, and, and you know, I've not had an easy life. But I have had that foundation, and I have those scriptures in my heart. And I call on those scriptures all the time to help me, no matter what situation I'm in. And so um, I'm very thankful that I have that background. I met my husband, Philip Napier, um, when I was 18. Well, I, I, we married when I was 18. I actually met him when I was 11. We uh, you know, dated him throughout um, my high school days. And I married him when I was 18, and then we immediately had an instant family. It was boom. You know, I had my son, Alan, when I was 19. I had my daughter, Michelle, when I was 21. And then... We were blessed with identical twin daughters when I was 23. Their names are, are Carmen and Megan. And I remember that I raised my children the same way that I was raised. I brought them up in the church, and I, and I taught them about Christ. And, you know, I did my best to, to help them understand that, that, you know, that relationship that we're supposed to have with Christ. And I'm thankful that I can tell you that all of my children accepted Christ into their lives. And then I, you know, through the rest of our journey as a family, and, you know, some of you in here I know, um, I sat by... Um, guy who has, um, you know, five children, and so I know that, you know, uh, the more children you have in that home, the more chaotic it is, and, um, you know, that journey that we had was, you know, uh, bumpy, and, and um, you know, I did a lot of praying, as you can imagine, and my marriage wasn't, um, you know, what it should be. We struggled throughout the whole uh, time, and after 21 years, my husband 
um, it said, you know, I want a divorce. And I can tell you that that was quite devastating to me because, you know, I was in it for the, the long haul, you know, and wanted to continue to work on it. Um, but when someone tells you that it's over, uh, there's not much you can do about it. And that was quite devastating for me. And even as that, that Christian girl who loved Jesus, for the first time in my life, I found myself hating someone. And I'm not, um, I'm not proud of that fact. I'm very ashamed of that. But I hated him with everything that I had in my, in my body to hate someone with, you know. And you've heard that expression, uh, hell hath no fury, like a woman scorned. I was the epitome of that at that point in time. I definitely was. And, um, you know, my dad used to kind of sit back and kind of look at me and, and laugh, you know. And he, he quoted that to me I don't know how many times because I cried on his shoulder so many times. And I told him, you know, the, the pain that Philip had brought on my family and, and myself, you know, and I, and I cried about my children and the, and the suffering that I saw them going through with a family that was broken. And, you know, my dad kept telling me, you know, um, Renee, your children will be okay when they see that you're okay. And, you know, even though I knew that he was right, um, there are just some times when you just don't want to face that. You know, I know my dad's right, but it's just too hard for me to let it go. And for whatever reason, you know, I wanted to hold on to that anger. And, you know, I, uh, the hatred didn't last very long because I asked God to take that away, and he did. Um, but I had bitterness and anger, and I, I prayed every day for God to forgive, you know, to, for God to help me to learn to forgive Philip. And in my heart, I thought that I had. And then about a year and a half into our divorce, uh, I had a friend who told me, we had a conversation in our church parking lot, and he said, Renee, you're very bitter. And I said, no, I'm not. You know, I'm here, I'm smiling, I'm happy. He goes, no, you're very bitter. And I argued with him again. I said, no, I'm not bitter. You know, you're going to make me bitter if you keep telling me that I'm bitter, you know. <laughs> but I, I really argued with him and said, no, I'm not. But, you know, I went home that night, and I thought about it. And I realized that I had a lot of bitterness in my heart and a bitter, bitterness in my words, and I realized that he was right. And so I decided, you know, I'm going to draw a line in the sand right here today. I'm going to step across that line. I'm going to put all of this behind me. You know, my ex-husband had gotten remarried. They had a child. And, and um, I'm just going to put all of that behind me, and I'm going to move forward. And I decided that um, I'm going to, you know, forget about them, and I'm going to move forward. I'm going to really, truly forgive him and, uh, you know, get on with my life. And I decided to go back to school. I never finished college, so I decided to go back to school. So I enrolled in classes at University of West Florida. You know, I just want to say how much of an honor it is to be here to speak to you guys here in Sioux Falls. Um, the story that you just heard about Renee's life is much different than what you'll hear come out of this mouth. Um, Renee was kind of the, exempl the example of Galatians 5.22. You know, the, spirits, uh, the, the, the fruits of the Spirit. I, on the other hand, was more along the lines of 519 through 21, which was the lust of the flesh. You know, I was raised in a family that was a very well-rounded family. It's just that we didn't really have a Christ center. We were more on the sand than we were on that rock that Renee was raised on. And it wasn't because there wasn't the belief. But I was talking to someone earlier, and, uh, you know, a belief is only as powerful as the actions that it produces. And you see, in our family... The belief didn't go any further than that. We believed in God, and that's not to say all members, but that I can only speak for myself. And for me, you know, I believed in God. I took the classes in school that, that talked about uh, evolution, and I just kind of wasn't buying that. But I wasn't really into the whole Christian thing either. You know, I saw people doing it. I saw student athletes, you know, in uh, FCA, and I thought that was a great thing. But back then, you know what they say about pride. It says, uh, pride comes before the fall or destruction and I was unfortunately a very prideful kind of guy and so growing up it wasn't that my that my that I wasn't well-rounded it was just that I wasn't Christian based in my upbringing and that's kind of how my life progressed I was a, a, a student athlete but I wasn't a Christian athlete I, I was actually blessed with the ability to play soccer like Stacy my dad was a JAG in the United States Air Force uh, he was a military so we moved all about the country. And so what happened with me is uh, it gave me a, a, an ability to move around and kind of adapt to whatever situation I had to be in. Um, the way I adapted, it was like a blessing and a curse all at once, is I learned to play sports really well. And so there's two things that I learned to do is play soccer and make friends. Because every time you move, you have to make friends again. And so I was really good at that. And so when we, I landed in Tallahassee, Florida, my dad retired, I decided to do what I always had known and to try out for the soccer team 
and, and try to make friends that way. And amazingly enough, that blessing and curse came into effect because I actually made the varsity soccer team as a freshman. And so here I was, an athlete in high school, I'm, you know, 14 years old, and I'm hanging out with juniors and seniors. And so in my, in my thought process, it was if I can play hard on the field with them, I can play hard off the field with them. You know, one thing that Renee didn't mention is that in her upbringing, when she was 14 years old, she decided that she was never going to experience alcohol. And she has still never experienced alcohol in her entire life. Um, for me, it was a little different. I experienced alcohol at a very young age. And that's kind of what led to Renee and I meeting. You see, I went on experimenting throughout college. I was not a, it wasn't that I didn't have any sense. I was actually a very smart kid. I went to Florida State University. I started to get my priorities mixed up. I started to go to more of the social outings than I did study sessions. And the next thing you know, I was having to make a life change. And that change took me to Pensacola, Florida, where I thought that I was going to get my life on track. You see, but along the way, I had still not met Christ. I was still relying on my own ability to have it all figured out. You know, and a lot of times, unbelievers don't realize it, but they don't have it figured out. You know, when they lean on their own understanding, things can get a little bit out of control. And that's what happened for me. You see, I had moved locations, but my heart had not changed. I was still that guy that was thinking that I had it all figured out and I could handle every situation that came my way. And so when I went to Pensacola, I started doing really well in school. But there was one thing that I didn't do. I didn't stop drinking and going out and having a good time and thinking that I could, that I could handle my own, my, myself. You know, I didn't have scripture to, to, to base any of my actions on. You know, in, in Timothy, in second, uh, Philippians 2.3, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain deceit, but in all things consider others better than yourself. And you see, at that point in my life, I knew nothing about that. All I knew is that I thought I could handle my alcohol and that getting behind the wheel of a car was no big thing because I knew my limits. And so on May 11, 2002, I went out and I had a couple drinks with some friends. And as a, a senior in college, I thought that I, I could handle myself. I was 24 years old, and it would be no problem if I walked out to the car and drove home because I had not drinking too much. I knew that I hadn't reached my limit. You know, they don't call alcohol liquid courage for no reason. You know, I believed in my heart that night that I was fine to drive. And so that's what I did. I made my way out to my car, and it was almost like God was trying to intervene to a guy that knew, that knew nothing of him. Because when I went out to the truck, it wouldn't start. And this truck had never given me a problem before in my life. And so I, you know, I didn't take the moment of pause and say, you know what, maybe I shouldn't be driving. Instead, that confidence, that pride stepped in and said, man, you're going to need to get this car started so you can go ahead and drive home because you're fine. You don't need to give in and, you know, you're an athlete and you're a, all of us are up for a good challenge. So instead of taking, it's like an omen. God was like, son, don't drive this truck right now. But do you think I saw that? He and I were not communicating. I thought that I had it figured out. And so I got behind the wheel of that truck that night. And, and I called a friend, and he said he was in the neighborhood, so he was from Pensacola area. He came down and helped me out. But during this process, we're starting to hook up jumper cables, and Mike, he was a, a, a resident from Pensacola, from, from the area, knew a lot of the local people. And so he was helping me put the jumper cables on my truck, and he, he looked across the hood at me, and he said, hey, Eric, are you sure you should drive tonight? And of course, what do you think I said? I don't know if anybody's had any uh, experience trying to deal with a person who's under the influence. It's usually not a very pleasant experience. Uh, I told him how fine I was, that I could handle myself, and I didn't need a babysitter, and that I, I even went as far as to tell him that he, if he would go ahead and jumpstart my truck, I would call him and let him know I made it okay. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard that situation before when somebody might be a little bit under the influence. You know, sometimes we will say, hey, man, just call me and let me know you made it all right. You know, and the reality of that is, is who is that for? Is that for that person or is that for you? So I, I, do, I do encourage you all to never allow your friends to drive under the influence uh, just because you wouldn't want to lose a friend. But also, this situation, how it plays out, is, is, is just something you would have never thought of. You see, Mike ended up saying, okay, man, fine. Just call me when you get home and let me know you made it okay. And so he jump-started my truck, and I left that night. And do you think I was able to call Mike? Not this time. I didn't, Mike never received a call from me. 
But Mike did receive a phone call. Mike received a phone call from another friend of his. That phone call was letting him know that Megan and Lisa were killed that night by a drunk driver. That drunk driver was me. He learned that he lost two friends that night. Renee got something totally different. The next morning, Renee got a knock on the door. She had lost a child. You know, I uh, will never forget that morning of May 11th. Uh, it was early in the morning. It was, well, it was about 8.45, and my sister-in-law came to the door. And I see her standing there, and I'm kind of confused at why she's there, you know, because she came unannounced. And, and um, I looked at her, and she said, there's been an accident. It was Megan. She didn't make it. And, you know, um, as you all know, that's every parent's worst nightmare is to find out that you've lost one of your children. And I denied it like three times. I just screamed out, you know, from the depths of my soul, no, you know, and I kept looking at her and saying, you're kidding. I mean, I just, I just wanted to look in her face and see that this was not really the reality, that I had not really and truly lost a child. And she allowed me to, to have that moment there where I was just, you know, um, wailing from deep down in the depths of my soul. And, you know, she stood there, and, and then, um, you know, she came in, and, and as she was watching me grieve, you know, she looked at me, and she said, Renee, we need to tell Philip. He doesn't know yet. And she said, do you want me to go and tell him? Because you know what? Barbara had been uh, living around me and had seen that bitterness in me. And she had seen me a year before when, when our daughter, Michelle, had gotten married, how I would not even sit on the same row as Philip and his wife. And, you know, these things, as I talk about them, you know, they, they make me so ashamed of myself, you know, but I was so hurt by him. But now here's our child who is gone. And I looked at her, and, you know, she offered to go and tell him for me, and I said, no, that was our child. I need to go and tell him. So I made my way to Philip's house, and I can tell you that, you know, I knew where he lived because I had stalked him once, and I already knew where the, where the house was. I just needed to see it, you know, um, because that's what we do as women. And um, I led everybody right there straight to that house and knocked on the door. And we showed up there with three policemen. Uh, my boyfriend at the time, Brian, was with us, and Barbara and I showed up at the door. Philip opened the door, looked at me, and he said, which one was it? And I, you know, cried as I told him that it was Megan and her friend Lisa had died too. And so that began our day. And we had to make funeral arrangements and we had to get our other children home. They were not in town at the time. And, and so that afternoon, um, Philip and I went with our fathers to the funeral home to pick out a coffin. And, you know, um, taking in that whole scene, and I'd never done that before, you know. And, and um, after, that, after that horrible experience of being at a funeral home and um, planning a funeral for my daughter, something I'd never planned to do. We left, and his dad was riding in the car with us, and his dad got out. We, we stopped at a store so he could go in and get a Diet Coke, and so Philip and I were alone in the car, and I said, you know what, Philip, I don't know if this is the appropriate time or not, but I just want to let you know that I forgive you for everything, and you know, he said, Renee, um, thank you so much. That really means a lot to me, and I can tell you that at that moment, this is the truth. God just unleashed, he, he took off all those shackles and those chains that had been binding me for those three years. And they just dropped to the ground and I was free. For the first time in three years, I was completely free. And I knew that I was going to be okay. And I knew that we had something way bigger that we had to face together. And I'm very thankful that I had the courage to tell him face to face that I forgive him. And you know... Um, I, I realized that God was also preparing me for someone else that I was going to have to forgive, and that was Eric. And that day, we um, went back to Philip's house, and we, we used his house as the hub for everybody to come and greet us. And, and our friends and family came, and, and his house was full of people. And I was kind of in a fog, but, you know, um, I saw him sitting over there in his chair. And, and um, you know, I have to tell you that um, a story that I forgot to mention, and, and, and it's a very pivotal moment for me. Um, but when, when I'd gotten divorced, you know, I wanted vengeance on him. I wanted to, um, you know, that, that's a, I, I believe that's a natural thing for all of us. I wanted to get back at him, and I wanted to hurt him. 
um, like he had hurt me, and I didn't really know how to do that. And, you know, I know that the Bible teaches us, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Um, but, you know, I didn't know if I could wait for God's vengeance. I didn't know if that was going to be this side of heaven or that side of heaven, you know, the other side. And so I needed to see it right here on the earth, a little bit at least. And so Philip had a prized possession, and it was a fish. It was a blue marlin. Y'all may not be aware of blue marlin up here in South Dakota, but, you know, that was his trophy, and it was 13 and a half feet long and weighed, uh, you know, almost 500 pounds, and he was very proud of it. And he had had it mounted, and it was on our living room wall for many years. And when we got divorced, you know, I gave him a couple of opportunities to come and get that fish, and he didn't come and get it. And so I sold it. And I didn't just sell it. I sold it to a restaurant that I knew that he went to. Um, and... <laughs> And it's called Flounders, Pensacola Beach, if you ever want to go and view it. Um, and it says the Marlin Bar on it right now. It's, they've they've um, airbrushed the Marlin Bar on it. But, you know, I knew that, that uh, he went there and I went there. And, and um, you know, so I, I knew that that would be a, a jab to him. And, and, and I was kind of, you know, satisfied with that. But that night I'm looking at him and I see him sitting there in his chair. And um, I just walked over to him and I said, you know, while we're at it, I just want to apologize to you for selling your fish. And um, he laughed, and he said, Renee, it's okay. He said, I thought about having a plaque made for it that said, caught by Philip Napier, released by ex-wife Renee. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I wasn't aware of this, but our son was watching, and he saw us communicating, and he saw us interacting and, and laughing. And he came over and he said, Dad, get up. We need to have a group hug. And you know, those words of my father rang true at that moment. Your kids will be okay when they see that you're okay. And so, um, you know, I'm so thankful that we had that moment because our family needed to be united for what we were about to face because we had to have a funeral. And, you know, we had to have a trial. And there's just really no way that you can get prepared for that other than having that unity of your family and, and praying. And I prayed every day, and I was in this darkness. And, and the scripture that Linda quoted a while ago, you know, this is a day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. I got up every morning and I said that out loud, even, and then I followed it up a lot of mornings with, you know what, God, I do not feel like rejoicing today, but I'm going to trust in you and I'm going to say that scripture every day until I actually mean it and until the day that I really do have joy in my heart. And so we went, you know, 14 months later, we had a trial, a week-long trial, very hard emotional week for everyone. And I can tell you that, you know, for Eric Smallridge, um, I, I promised myself when I hated Philip and I got through that part that I would never hate another person, so I would not allow myself to hate him. And, and he was the same age as my son. They were born the same year, same age. And I realized that I, I would be very arrogant as a mom if I thought that my son couldn't make that same mistake. And so I, um, I, I didn't want to hate him, but I still had a lot of anger and I had a lot of rage, and I had rage toward God, and I shouted out at God, and I told him how angry I was at him because I didn't understand he could have, why he would allow that to happen. He could have stopped that from happening. And here I have this, you know, and God just kind of he put his arms around me and, and just let me know that it, it's okay. You know, he gave me peace, and he let me know that it was okay to be angry at him and that it was okay to be angry at Eric. And, you know, I just had to trust, and I had to have faith. And we went through that week-long trial, and I remember that even through that week, you know, the anger that I had in me um, was because Eric had pled not guilty and because I had seen no remorse in him. You know, you might wonder why a guy would plead not guilty to an accident that he obviously was the cause of. But as you know, um, when you're a Christian, you know that God will not allow you to be tempted beyond your means. But as a human being that has no relationship with Christ, I was that lost soul. I thought that I had committed a crime, I had committed a sin against not only the Napiers and the Dixons, I had not only let my family down, I had destroyed my future. Um, I was a person that was um, just lost in this world. And so I was very vulnerable. And when they started telling me about the length of time that you can get for a DUI manslaughter, I did whatever they said to do. I became heavily medicated, um, had a lot of suicidal thoughts, thought that maybe if I just took myself out, then maybe that would make up for it. But then I thought about the loss that my family would experience. And so that was the main reason why I was so easily uh, led to plead not guilty in that, in that moment. You know, they say, in your weakness, Christ is the strongest. But what happens when you don't have Christ? In your weakness, you're just weak. And that was me. 
And so when we went through that trial, I had no other, I had no other way of, of going about it but to plead not guilty because, and the truth is, I did not want to be guilty. I did not want to believe that I had caused all of this that was going on in that courtroom at that time. And so not guilty came out of my mouth, and that's actually all I said. I was told not to testify, so I just sat there like a blank person that I was because that's really what I was. I was hollow. There was nothing going on inside. And so as Renee and, and, and her family and the Dixons looked on, that's really what they were seeing. They were seeing a shell of a man who did not know Christ and had no foundation to stand on. But then I was taken away to jail. And I know you guys maybe have heard of jailhouse religion or, or chain gang religion or whatever it may be called. And I'll tell you the truth. You're looking at a classic example of it. You know, and I will tell you this right now. There is no bad place or time to meet Christ because that's where I met him. And you know, that was the biggest change that I've ever made in my entire life. I'd always heard about him, but I had never seen him. I had always seen people and I just assumed like Renee said that all Christians just think their lives are peachy cream and that everything is going to be fine for them but they go through struggles too so what's the really what's the point of it and I didn't understand it and I still had my doubts of whether I could actually become a Christian because I, I felt that I had tempted God beyond his you know his his allowance I figured that he would look at me and say I, I, I don't know you you know get away from me and so I was actually in, in prison with a doctor that the Napiers knew, and he had followed the whole story. And he, he came to me one day, and he told me about this road to salvation. And of course, I, I wanted to hear what he was saying, because God had brought me to that place in my life where I needed a Savior. You know, growing up, being the athlete that I was, you know, having the, the upbringing in the military background, I was a very confident person. At this point in my life, I was nobody. And I knew that I needed a savior. He brought me to that weakest moment and I wanted to experience his strength. And so uh, it was so ironic. And you know, like Renee said, there are no such thing as coincidences, just appointments. And it was appointed that day on June 29th, 2003, that that pastor was supposed to come, the chaplain of the jail, with a Bible that my mom had sent to me because she knew I was gonna be having a hard time. My mom was always one of those believers that didn't wanna step on your toes. And so if you didn't want to go to church, that was okay. She'll go sing in the choir. And if you want to come see her, she'll be there. You know, but she was always the person that didn't want to push too much. But my mom knew that I needed something to stand on at this moment in my life. And so she sent me this Bible. And it just so happens that the chaplain's name was Chaplain Miller. My mother's maiden name is Miller. And so all these things were coming together. And I thought to myself, and the doctor had been talking to me about this road to salvation that I knew nothing of. And here is the chaplain handing me a Bible saying, if you ever want to pray, I'd love to, I'd love to pray with you. If you would like to, for me to introduce you to Christ, I can do that. And now I was, it was like confirmation to me that maybe I'm not lost. You know, I got a chaplain telling me, not just another inmate. You know, because when, when another inmate tells you something, you're like, well, what do you know? You're right here with me. You know, but here I have a person of the Lord, a chaplain. He's telling me that I can be saved. And so I said, you know, I, I, I need a savior. I need to be where Renee is. I need to know that there is something out there for me. And so I went into that, that, that cell that day with, the, with the, um, the chaplain, and we sat there and prayed. And I don't know if any of you have experienced it, but the weight of the world felt like it came off of my chest. I felt like that scripture that says, I will, I will not allow you to be tempted beyond your means, but when you are tempted, I will provide you a way out. You know, if you read that and have no experience with Christ, you'll be like, well, what's the way out? Well, obviously it's through him. And what that, what that day prepared me for was a sentence that was to come. And that sentence was a very lengthy prison sentence that I don't think I would have been able to handle as that hollow person that I had become before meeting Christ. You know, after the trial um, was the very first time that I actually got anything from Eric and I got a letter and it came very soon, you know, he had been convicted of um, two counts of DUI manslaughter and, you know, we felt pretty good about that and, and um, that, that he got that conviction. And now I've got this letter that I've been um, really needing to read and, and he was apologizing for his actions in, that, in the crash that occurred that night. And, you know, he was still, in my opinion, you know, I read it and, and I, I still felt like he was a little bit guarded because he hadn't been sentenced yet. but. Um, 
I, I remember reading that letter for the very first time, and I, I, I had to go pick it up at the, uh, at the courtroom. At the, attorney's, the, the attorney was right across the street from the courthouse. And I, I can't remember why I had to do that, but I remember that I, I couldn't wait to get in my car, and I opened it immediately, and I read it. And I sat there. As I read through that letter, I just sobbed. I mean, the tears just flowed freely. And then I started calling people. I called my mom and my dad, and I called my children, and I was reading that letter to them over the phone. And, you know, at least the first time, the first ten times that I read it, you know, I was crying. I just this, this, all this emotion was coming out because I needed to hear those words, I'm sorry. And, you know, that was the first time that I'd actually had words from him. And I want to tell you, I was a little skeptical about the letter, too, because the handwriting was so perfect and so beautiful that I thought, his mom wrote it, you know. And, <laughs> and I sat there, and I had this conflict going on in the car. I really and truly, and I'm talking to somebody, I said, but it really looks like his mom wrote it. And then I looked, and it, and it was stamped, you know, came from a correctional facility. And, and I thought, well, she couldn't have done it. You know, there's just no way. And, then, and so I finally just had to go, you know what, God? I'm just going to believe that this came straight from Eric, and I want you to know that since then I've seen his handwriting, and it really was from him. And so I, I was very relieved to get that letter. And, you know, as we um, went on and had his sentencing um, in that day in the courtroom at his sentencing, that was my moment to be able to, to make an impact statement. They call it a victim impact statement. And I'd been preparing it for over a year. You know, every time I thought about something, I would sit down at my computer and I would go and type out what I wanted to say. And I'll never forget that day in that courtroom, you know, my, my whole family had our, our opportunity to speak, you know, and this was before the judge ruled. And I, wrote, I read through my letter and I told Eric, you know, in the court and in the public, you know, what, I had, been, what had been taken away from our family and, and all of the, the events that had gone on during that year and all the things that I had to do without my daughter in my life. And, um, and then I looked at Eric and I said, Eric, I forgive you. And for me, you know, that, that was the moment that the healing truly began for me. And, you know, I'm very thankful that I uttered those words. Someone asked me recently, did you really mean it 100%? And I said, you know what? I think I did, but it doesn't matter. Because those are such powerful words. There's so much power in those words that I know the healing began for me. And I hoped that it had begun for him. And I can remember watching him as he was being taken out of that courtroom that day, you know, and God had been working on my heart. I'd been praying through this whole process. And I was seeing God at work. And, you know, we got that apology that we needed, that we needed to hear directly from his mouth because after I was able to forgive him, say, I forgive you, he had his moment to speak. And that was the first time we had heard him actually speak. And, you know, he, he had an apology for all of us, and we desperately needed to hear it. And then in a few minutes after the judge ruled and gave him the 22-year sentence, 11 years for each girl, and he ran it consecutively for 22 years, then we watched this whole scene in that courtroom as this young man was being carried out in handcuffs and taken away from his family. And as a mom, I just could not imagine what that had to feel like to see your son going away for 22 years. And I was so compassionate for him and I was so conflicted because I was so thankful for that 22-year sentence because I felt like justice had been served. But now I'm watching the reality of this human being that's going to, to be in prison for 22 years, and I can't even imagine what his life is going to be like. You know, receiving a 22-year sentence, you know, the judge read it off. You're found guilty of DUI manslaughter for the death of Megan Napier. You were receiving 11 years and four years probation. You were found guilty of DUI manslaughter for the death of Lisa Dixon. 11 years, four years probation to follow. It was his option of, of running them consecutive at the same time or concurrent. Or concurrent is at the same time, consecutive is one after the other. He had the option to do one or the other and he chose to go with the consecutive sentences. Now. As with a guy sitting at that, that, that table, a lawyer on either side, standing to be pronounced judgment upon, I can, only, I can imagine that you would know, maybe have a, a, a thought of how that might feel. But the amazing thing was, is that that transformation that took place in the jailhouse made it where it didn't matter what the judge said. When he told me that he was going to run them consecutive, it didn't change my my outlook on it all. I knew that I was guilty. I knew that I should have
pled guilty in the first place. Because now I had the strength of Christ within me. I felt the indwelling of Christ. I knew that, I, that if I was following Christ, this would have never happened. But he had decided to allow me to be one of his own. And that no matter what the sentence, he was going to be there. He was never going to leave me or forsake me. I had read these words now. And I had had the scripture in my heart and I could stand on it. And that power that he gives through the forgiveness. When Renee said, Eric, she looked at me and she said, Eric, I forgive you. You know, if I was still so young in the faith that if she would have walked over and slapped me in my face, I would, have, I would have understood that more than I did when she looked at me and said, I forgive you. And the power of forgiveness just spread through our whole story. It's the same power that Christ gave when he died on the cross for us and forgave us of our sin. But you see, a lot of us never get the opportunity to really see that right there so bluntly in our face as I did that day. And that power that was given to me by the glory of Christ and the grace of God, that forgiveness that was spoke to me, changed my life too. Because when I went to prison, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I went from having a, law, a pre-law student as a roommate to having this older gentleman who had gray hair, one eye was glazed over with glaucoma, the other was bright blue. And as I enter his cell, he turned and looked at me and didn't say a word. And they slammed the door behind me. You know, and I wasn't super scared, but I was pretty scared. But I knew, <laughs> I knew that God was not going to put me in a situation. I felt his hedge of protection on me. I didn't know who this guy was, but I knew that I was going to be okay. Why? I don't know. It's like Stacy said, the peace that surpasses all understanding. You don't understand why you're, you're feeling the way you're feeling, but you just know that it's going to be okay. And it turns out the way I found out who this guy was is they, they called us for laundry. And of course, I was new to this whole system. And so I didn't know what was going on. So I just followed everybody else's lead. And, you know, I started learning early in jail and the first few days in prison that you don't ask people why they're in prison. That's just not proper etiquette. And plus, you probably don't want to know why, you know. <laughs> and in this case, that was exactly what happened. I didn't really I didn't need to know this. But I left that night to go down to get our laundry. And when I came back, there was a newspaper article on my bed. And so I thought, OK, this is awkward. And, and his name was Geezer. This was his nickname. Richard went by Geezer. He looked like he was a pretty, he was pretty, he was an older gentleman. I wasn't sure how long he had been in this spot, but I soon found out that he had been incarcerated since 1965 and that he had earned his gray hair and the glaucoma while in prison because he was serving a life sentence for killing a correctional officer way back in the day. And so when I walked in and I read this, this article, I thought to myself, I've got myself in a jam and I'm glad I know Christ because he's got this hedge of protection around me. That's just one of the many stories that I could tell you about my experiences in prison. I, I'll, I'll leave it to your imagination to, to, to think about what prison is like. But without that forgiveness, without that indwellment of Christ, I would have been nobody. You know, throughout the process of, of, of incarceration, you have the opportunity to appeal your sentence. And, and so, of course, I wanted to utilize that, that, that right that I had. But I always told Renee and her family whenever I was appealing that I was not appealing my innocence that I knew I was guilty. I just wanted to, to see if the court may reconsider. We had heard him say something about the, the concurrent sentences and not the consecutive, and we wanted to see if maybe they would grant me a new trial and go ahead and go with concurrent sentences. So we were appealing and appealing and appealing, and every man that we came encounter with said no. So we decided to go to the United States Supreme Court, but even on that level, we got a no. But God had something else in store. So we knew that Eric was appealing his sentence and because every time he did, I got a big um, envelope in the mail with all this uh, legal stuff, and I can honestly tell you I didn't read through it because I, I wouldn't have understood half of it, I'm sure. But I knew the, the gist of it, and that was that they were appealing. And my dad had told me that that appeals process is very costly. And, you know, about a year and a half into Eric's prison sentence, so it's probably going on to 2004, 2005, um, I had begun doing DUI presentations in 2004, and, and so I was out, you know, trying to speak in schools and churches. And now um, I'm, my, my mom had gotten on his calling list right after he went to prison, 
And I was at her house one day, and it's, you know, about a year and a half into his sentence, and he called. And so um, I got on the phone with him, and the first thing that he said to me is, I want you to know that I take full responsibility for what I did that night. And I can tell you that, you know, that was some words that I really had been praying and longing to hear. I, I hoped that one day I would hear him take responsibility. And so um, my daughter, Michelle, and I had had a conversation right after that. You know, I, I encouraged Eric to write to all of my family and, and be the, let him be the one delivering that message. So he wrote to my family and the Dixons, you know, to everyone, my sister, my brother, my mom, my dad, my children, my ex-husband, the Dixons, and let them know that he took responsibility for what he had done. And I got a phone call from my daughter at some point, my daughter Michelle, and she said, Mom, is it a burden on you that he's going to be in prison for 22 years? And I was so relieved to hear her say that because it was a burden on me. And, you know, my heart was pretty heavy about that because, you know, as we talked as a family, we felt like 22 years would be very detrimental for this young man who was a good person, came from a good home, made one bad choice that night and, and you know, a fatal mistake. But we, we really were compassionate toward him. So we got together with the Dixon family and um, his family, and we all um, went before the judge. We, we, we got him a, a, a date, a hearing date, um, on August 18th of 2006. That motion, y'all, was the biggest thing in my entire life. You know, I'd already met Christ, and I will tell you right now that that was obviously the moment that changed everything for me, is the day that I, hands down, gave my life to Christ. You know, for a while back there, I was a little on the suicidal side, and we were at dinner last night, and I shared the analogy of the poker game where you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. You know, and back then, in my hollowness, in my humanness, in my flesh, I wanted to fold that deck. And that, what, what I mean is I wanted to commit suicide back then. But so when I met Christ, that all changed, and I gave him that hand. And he did his little, made a little wand maneuver and turned it around, and we had nothing but aces. As a matter of fact, we had five aces, not only four. We had five. And this, this motion ended up being that fifth ace. And the thing was, is as I said, we got denied on every level. Man, the justice system, said no. But you see, God knew that someone in this room might need to hear the story about forgiveness. And you see, without that forgiveness that I was given, I wouldn't be standing here right now. My original sentence was supposed to end in 2022. That was the earliest date that I was ever supposed to see the other side of those fences. But instead, the Lord decided that he had something else in mind. And so that day, when I was granted that hearing, and these hearings, they're called a uh, motion for reduction or modification. And, the, and, and what they are called in the chain gang is a beggar's motion. Because during these, during these hearings, there are no statutes of law quoted. They don't want to hear about precedent. They don't want to hear about anything law related. They want to hear why they should give you mercy. And on that day, I did not go there and beg for mercy. The most amazing thing happened is the, the, the Napiers and the Dixons spoke on my behalf. You know, a lot of the times... There's probably many lawyers maybe in this room. And my lawyer looked at me and he said, there's one thing we learn in law school, and that's when to talk and when not to talk. And so when we got there, he looked at the judge and he pretty much said that to him. He said, Your Honor, we're going to allow the Napiers and Dixons to do the talking today. We just want to respect the court and to present this motion for reduction or modification. And that day, 11 members of the Napiers and Dixon family came up and spoke on my behalf. And that is the only reason why I'm standing here today. And just to put an exclamation point on it, God wanted everyone in that courtroom to know who was in charge that day. And you know how he did that? There were no statutes, but there were scriptures. And they weren't coming from the Smallridge family or the Napiers or the Dixons. They were probably coming from there too, but they were coming straight from the judge. The judge looked at me that day. And, and the craziest thing is, is, you know, I read a lot of spiritual books, and, you know, sometimes uh, when the masses congregate, they, uh, you know, in one of the uh, Left Behind series books, you know, they were speaking a certain language, and everybody heard it in their own language, you know. Um, and so I kind of relate that to this, is that while the judge was speaking that day, in my heart, in my mind, and I know it was really spoken, there was a scripture that just resonated in my mind. And I mean, I went, when I got back to my jail cell, I mean, it's in bright yellow in my Bible. Because what he said was, Eric, I want you to know that these families have done something amazing today. I've been on this bench for 20 years, and I have never seen anything like this happen before. He said, I'm going to run your sentences concurrent. He said, because of what they've done for you, but also because what it says in Micah 6, 8. 
And it says, O man, what does the Lord require of thee? But to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. And when he said that, goosebumps all over, I knew who was in charge of that hearing. And I knew that God had a plan for Renee and I, and that's what we're accomplishing here today. And hopefully, we're touching your lives with the power of forgiveness. And the, and the amazing thing was, is I heard that scripture, Renee heard another one. Um, that, that day was um, a day that I, I, I will always treasure. I've never been more proud of my family, uh, my children, my ex-husband, my mom, and my dad, and my brother, and um, just every word that was spoken that day. Um, and, and like Eric said, you know, the scripture that my family heard was James 2.13. For judgment is without mercy to those who show no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so, um, you know, I don't even have to, to tell you any more than that, but, you know, God was at work. He's been at work through this whole process. He's been listening to every prayer that was uttered. And I, and I can tell you that even in the most desperate of times, when you are in that pit and that darkness that I've been in, if you just trust him and just bank on those scriptures and, and rely on God, you know, and, and just give him your hand and let him pull you out of that darkness, he will do it. He is faithful. You know, the, the song, Standing on the Promises, well, that's what I've been doing my whole life. I've been standing on those promises, and I can tell you that it is not, they're not empty. They're not empty promises at all. And so today, you know, um, Eric and I have been able, since 2010, you know, I, I started in 2004 doing my presentations, and I always wanted him to join me. And in 2010, the Department of Corrections, I went before them, and they allowed it to happen. I've, I've met just about all of our sheriffs in the state of Florida, and, and they're 100% behind me. And, you know, they had to go and pick him up while he was incarcerated and bring him, and he was chained and shackled and handcuffed, and, and we would do our presentations together, and, and now he's a free man, and we're still continuing, as you can see, to go and, and share this testimony. And even in the schools, you know, I don't tell this story without talking about forgiveness. And I can tell you the power of that forgiveness, you know, students will come to us at the end, and they will promise that they will never drive under the influence. And then later I will get a message that says, you know, I promise you I won't drive under the influence, but I want you to tell me about that forgiveness. And they've told me that they've forgiven a dad for molesting him, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a father for just, you know, being absent in their lives, um, you know, a mom for being in prison, a, a brother for being in prison. I, I hear so many stories of how young people have been able to forgive because they've heard this story. And it's really important for you today to realize that this is not about Renee and Eric. The story, yes, it's our story. But there's a bigger story here, and that is why we're here today. And the bigger story is that, you know, Jesus Christ sacrificed his life for us. And on the cross that day, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he's the perfect example of forgiveness, not us. But what we are is a human um, model, I guess, of that. And what God can do, and what the power of forgiveness can do, if you just will allow it to, and so today, you know, um, I hope that you will think about someone that you need to forgive. And I realize that people drag things through their whole lives, and they let it, you know, make them angry every time somebody's name is mentioned. And you, you know, make a face. I mean, I'm guilty of that myself. But I just want to encourage you that if there's someone in your life that you need to forgive for something that happened 30 years ago or something that happened today or yesterday, then I want to encourage you to say those words and let God free you because, you know, if you really think about it, we're all human, we've all sinned, we all fall short of the glory of God, and we all are, are in need of forgiveness. And, you know, um, in 2010, I was able to write my story into Matthew West because he's the Christian music artist, and he asked people to write their stories in. And I wrote my story into him just hoping that, that God could use this in a bigger way than I could ever do it on my own. And I didn't get a, a song. He, he was writing an album called The Story of Your Life. Didn't get a song, so I thought that that door was shut. Got, I got recognized that, that he was going to put my story in a book that he had written. You know, I knew that he had gotten over 10,000 submissions for that um, of stories. And I thought, well, you know, everybody has a story. We're all, we all have a story. We're all storytellers. And so I felt like that door had shut, you know, about a, a song. And then in May of 2012, I was called to a radio station uh, down in the area of, of Florida that I lived in. And um, they wanted to let me know that um, I, I thought I was there for a radio interview, so they bamboozled me. But then they, they, showed, they told me that Matthew West had um, written a song, and it was called Forgiveness, and they wanted to play it for me that day. And I want to just tell you real briefly, because this is the, the close, um, I want to tell you before we're going to play the song here and let you listen to it. Um, but I just want to briefly tell you that um, 
when Matthew came out, he said, Renee, I carried your story for about two years in my guitar case. He said, I read it when I was in that cabin two years ago, and he said, God just didn't want it to be on that first album, and I didn't understand why until now. And he said, my record label told me it was going to be my number one rele release on the new album coming out in the fall. And he said, I, so I, I, I had not been following you, and I thought, well, Renee has to know before the song comes out. And he said, I Googled your name, and I saw this article about you and Eric going and speaking, and I read that Eric will be released in November of 2012. And he said, um, and that's God's timing. And he said, you know, because the song is forgiveness, and it's because of your forgiveness that he's able to get out in November of 2012. And so what we'd like to do as we close today, we'd like to um, allow you to hear that song. Thank you so much.